On Wednesday nights, I enjoy uh, teaching the Word of God. I'm, I'm more of a, a teacher on Wednesday nights than I am a preacher. And we went through um, uh, First Kings and Second Kings, and we got to uh, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. You know, uh, First Kings and Second Kings is really from a human standpoint. And uh, when you get to First Chronicles and Second Chronicles, the amazing thing is, is we kind of get it from God's point of view. It's it's really unique. They're both similar stories, but you'll get a different understanding or a different angle at it when you look at it in uh, Chronicles as, than you do Kings. But I learned something this last time we were going through it. I had read it. I knew it. But in my heart, it really meant something special to me. There was a phrase when we were talking about King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam was a son of Solomon. And, you know, during the reign of King Rehoboam, the the, the nation split, the north and the south. There was kind of a civil war, so to speak. And, and this, the northern kingdom was called Israel, and Rehoboam stayed in the southern kingdom, and it was called Judah. But there was a phrase there about Rehoboam, and he says in Second Chronicles twelve fourteen, and he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Literally, what he's saying is, is there is an overflow from the life of the one who is not seeking the Lord. And there is an overflow from the life of the one who is seeking the Lord. Now, Asa uh, came along, uh, and he, as a king, he was just very quick, not too far behind uh, Rehoboam, but he says in 2 Chronicles 15, 2, this is God's word to him. Hear me, Asa. And all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. If you're seeking him, you'll find him. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. That's the word of God. It's true. God can't change his nature. The same nature that he had when he said those words, uh, to Asa about the, the children, is the same word that he says to us. Don't give me this, oh no, God was different in the Old Testament. Everything comes from the heart of God. It's the truth of God. It's the blessings. So you need to understand and hear this. If you're seeking, you'll find him. But if you're forsaking, you're on your own. Then it says about Jehoshaphat, another great king who did many great things. And it says this, in 2 Chronicles 19.3, you have prepared your heart to seek God. Prepared. That word means so very much. We're either taking it for granted, everything's nonchalant, or if you are preparing your heart to seek God, you'll find Him. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible says this, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it. There's a lot that we have up here that we're not doing. But faith is believing and then acting upon it. So it said, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the, the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. That's a good life. That's a good life. It's one that we should always be seeking to do. Open. Our hearts should always be pointed to God. No matter what, are we seeking or are we just existing? Are we walking close to his side or do we wander further away? Well, we're going to look at scripture today in uh, Mark chapter 3 and we're going to see some that we're not seeking. And because they were not seeking, they were forsaking. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Bless your word. Thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, we overlook you so much. People damn your name. They take you for granted. You are the whisper of our Lord, our God, and you are the power, the power of creation, the power of regeneration, 
the power of eternal life. So Lord, we today seek you, look towards you. And Lord, we pray that as we find you, that you will find all of us. And Lord, change us into your image for our sake and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Mark chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse number 20. Then the multitudes came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. That's, that's a crowd. You have so many things going on, you can't even take a snack, can't even take a minute away. Everything's packed together. And when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. They had never seen anything like this before. Verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. By the rulers of the demons, he cast out demons. So Jesus called them to himself and said to the parables, said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and who, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. You may be seated. Verse 20 it's a transitional time here, and he's moving away from uh, the, the big preaching times, and he's down by the Sea of Galilee, and the multitudes are coming again. I like that word multitudes, don't you? How many is a multitude? A heat bunch. A lot. So many that they got to the place, and they're ministering to the people that they, they don't even have time to break away and, and, and have a meal. They, they can't even take care of their own nourishment because they're dealing with everybody else. Some came wanting to know more just simply out of interest. That who is this person? We're hearing about him. There's a buzz. Let's go and see for ourselves. Some wanted a better life. Some thought that Jesus may be the one to overcome Rome and to set Israel free. This may be the, the ruler that we've been looking for. Some came for healing. There's nothing wrong with that. But some came to accuse and condemn. Word had gotten out. He had talking to, talked to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Herodians. They didn't like him very much, and it got back to Jerusalem. So here it says that there were some others that came out from Jerusalem, the scribes, the ones who knew the Word of God. Now, the ones who knew the Word of God should have been the first ones to see Jesus from the Word of God if they had open eyes and ears and hearts. If they were seeking God, then they would have been able to hear the Holy Spirit of God who leads us into truth. But they were not seeking God. And that meant they were vulnerable to see things through their own perspective through their own thoughts and through their own ways. Now, I, I, I respect your opinion, but not above God's. Right? You may lead me in the right way. You may lead me in the ditch. The blind leading the blind. That's not a good thing. But this is what comes when, when they came down there. Look, now, let me give you the perfect understanding of this. In Matthew chapter 12, in his... Uh, rendering of this same exact ordeal. It says when the multitudes came, there was someone that was there. This is uh, Matthew 12, verse 22. Let me re read it to you. Then one was brought to him who, had, who was demon-possessed. He was blind and he was mute. He was possessed by demons. He couldn't see and he couldn't talk. And Jesus healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. And all God's people said, 
Somebody demon-possessed. Jesus cast out the demon. This demon had a hold of him. He could not see. He could not speak. That's living life at a deficit. This man came and he, and he found healing in Christ. Well, the scribes are there. And look what it says in Mark 3, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. Beelzebub. The word Beelzebub means Lord of the house. Lord of the house. It also had a connotation, one of those, it came to mean this, the Lord of the flies. That came from the connotation of the Lord of dung. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Shake your head. And the flies that came. It was a name for Satan and his devils, Satan himself, because he was the Lord of the evil spirits. He was the prince of evil spirits. That's who they call Beelzebub. But, but they said of Jesus, he has this power. He cast out these demons by the power of Beelzebub, of the, de of the devil, Satan himself. Now, it's human nature to attack the one that doesn't agree with you. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about two kids on the playground at the elementary school. They get in a fuss. One says, well, I don't like you. And the other one says, well, I don't like you either. Right? And then they start throwing barbs at each other, trying to, to best the other at demeaning. And somebody will finally get tired of it, and they'll just say, well, you, well, you're ugly. Now that comes, they might be ugly, they may not be ugly, but isn't it funny how we always, if we're in disagreement with somebody, we have to push them down to lift ourselves up. We have to tear down so that we feel better about ourselves. And that's what they were doing to Jesus. They were afraid of him. Because in Matthew's account, in Matthew 12, when he healed this man that was demon-possessed and the, the demon left him, and now he can see and he can speak, some of the crowd said, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Christ, the anointed one? Could this be the Messiah? that God promised. This could be what we've been praying for. This could be what we're looking for. Now, the choir was singing about Jesus coming soon and, and, and our time with Him, and, and Lord, come quickly, right? What they were looking for was they were looking for the promised gift from God. By the way, Jesus was the Christ. He was the anointed one. But He didn't come at that moment to kick out Rome and to be the conquering hero, he became the conquering hero at Calvary. He became to be the Savior so we could have forgiveness of sins, so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could reign with Him forever in heaven. The Savior had to come first, because God can't have a, a relationship with a sinner. Could this be the Son of David? Could this be the Christ? Well, they, they're now threatened. So they begin to try to tell, tear him down. They're just simply giving in to the leadership of Satan. Now, I'm going to ask you in the next few minute, minutes to keep your ears open, the ears to your heart open, because I'm going to talk about Satan and how he gains control. Number one, he get, tries to gain control because he uses temptations. Anybody ever been tempted? Temptations is him trying to get you to sin against yourself. He leads you to think something that if you give into, you'll be better off, but you never are. It's a sin against you. Who gets hurt by temptation? We do. How many, how many of y'all been tempted again? 
How many of y'all have given in to temptations? Anybody ever succeed at that? Have, 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 you, have you been tempted and given in to the temptation and felt awful? I know sin thrills before it kills, but it never blesses. He wants you to sin against yourself. The second way that Satan comes, please hear me now, is he comes to bring in false thoughts, alternative thoughts, a different spin on the truth, a different way of looking at it, so to speak. He comes to give you a, a different explanation, a false understanding. And people believe it. But let's just remember, Satan is the father of lies. And if he can get you to believe a lie, he's got you. If he can get you to believe a lie and you're so influenced by the, to this lie, you have so bought into the lie, it will control you. It'll control your thoughts. It'll control your heart. It'll control your actions. And Satan is good at what he does. He is a liar and he is the father of lies. I love how the New American Standard Version, it says that when he says lies, when he tells lies, he's speaking his own native language. You ever heard the saying, you know, you know how so-and-so is telling a lie when his mouth's open? Right? You know how Satan, you know when Satan's telling a lie? When he's trying to get you to follow him. Now, how many of you know what I mean when I say the big lie? Have y'all ever heard of that? The big lie. Well, let me teach you something. The big lie is when it's a lie, but you just keep saying it over and 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 over again until you start to believe it's the truth. If you don't believe me, have y'all seen any political ads lately? And they know they're lying, and I know they're lying, and they know that I know that they're lying, but they keep saying it. Folks, this works. That's why the politicians do it, because it works. Go back to the times of uh, the first century. Herod burnt Rome down, but he blamed the Jews. He said the Jews did it. And he kept saying it over and over and over and over again until people hated the Jews. Hitler did it. After World War I, he said that Germany was in the economic troubles that it was in because of the Jews. It was the Jews' fault. And he kept saying it over and over and over and over again until all the German people thought it was okay to go kill Jews. Y'all ever heard of this thing called evolution? You, you ever heard of it? The guy that came up with the theory of evolution was called Charles Darwin. By the way, before he died, Charles Dar Darwin said, it can't be true. But somebody else took it up and ran. Now, as a matter of fact, the scientific world has bought into it. There is not one fact that backs evolution. Not one. Somebody bring me a, a, a fossil of a half dog, half cat. Somebody bring me proof of something that's in the intermediary state between what it was and what it evolved to. Guess what? You won't find it. You know why you won't find it? It's not there. But if they keep saying it over and over and over, now it's in the science books at school. Can I get personal? You can hate me if you want to, but I'm not going to change. Abortion. Abortion. Well, it's a woman's rights. She has a choice. It's her body. 
She can do with her body whatever she wants. Nobody has a right to tell me what I'm going to do. By the way, and the government needs to pay for it. And we'll, we will fund something in our country called Planned Parenthood. We will give them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars so that they can help women have abortions and take the life of their child. Mothers are supposed to keep, protect, and comfort their children. They're just using it as birth control. And they're going to say, oh, but what about rape and what about incest? Come on, folks. If we took the money that we're spending for people to have abortions, we could fund adoption a thousand times over. If the woman doesn't want to keep the child, there are plenty of people who would love to love some child. But we're going to say it over and over and over and over again until people are actually saying, yes, but this is my right. It's your right to take a life of a child. Really? What's God going to do for that child? Give him a home in heaven forevermore. And that child doesn't have to live in this world of sin and brokenness and shame. I call it the victims of abortion. Do you know how many women have gone through abortion and later on the heartache and the pain and the stress has come in their life? What they thought that they were going to do that was going to make their life better is a haunting thing that has made their heart cold. Folks, the big lie. Y'all hear me? How has Satan used the big lie? He speaks bad about us. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Is there, Satan ever called you a dirty dog? I mean, you, you try to do something right, but how many of you humans in here mess up? And how, how many times does Satan come and get on to you? Because you're not perfect. Any perfect people here? And he loves to whisper in your ear. How many people are on going to counseling? How many people are going on drugs? How many people feel depressed? And down, folks, this is a natural human feeling when they get stomped down and Satan laughs. He uses half truths, which is a full lie. His desire is to steal and kill and destroy. He doesn't have, and why do we let him rent space in our minds? Listen to me. These scribes, I don't think they're all bad people. I think they had good intentions and good intent. I'm not mad at them. But guess what? Like us, many of us today, they were influenced by the, the wrong leader. They were, in, they were influenced by the one that they were claiming that Jesus was in, empowered by. That's a scary thought. That's why in Chronicles it says, if you prepare your heart to seek God, you'll find Him. But if you don't prepare your heart, if you don't seek after God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. But you'll be like Rehoboam, who had never done anything wrong until he did. And it says that he did evil because he didn't prepare his heart to seek the Lord. What I'm telling you is, what we're trying to see here is, if you are not actively seeking God, you are going to make yourself and allow yourself to be vulnerable to the lies of Satan. He's good at what he does. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Jesus come to give you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. He came to give you the truth so it can set you, say it, free. Satan comes to bind you, to jail you, 
to laugh at you. And we need to tell him, excuse me for being so frank, we need to tell him to hush, be quiet. I don't want to hear any more words come out of your mouth. Get behind me, Satan. I love this song. It's, a, it, it, it's sung in a lot of the Pentecostal churches and a lot of the gospel churches. And that Baptist Costal comes out in me. And it says, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Under my feet, under my feet, Satan, you're under my feet. Brother Mark, sometimes we need to sing that for an invitation. We can do it. You know, he cleansed me. He kept me. I give God credit and glory for that. But we need to understand that the, the powers of the, the Lord of the flies is going around trying to encapture. Jesus says, look, Satan is, is, is smart, but there's no way in the world that he's going to turn anyone loose. He's too sh shrewd to liberate anyone that he's already enslaved. Look what it says in verse 22, verse 23. So he called them to himself and said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If Satan, if he's got a hold of this man and he's demon possessed, why in the world would he liberate him by the power of Satan? That doesn't make sense. Look what he says in, in, in verse number 24. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a family, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. A church that is divided cannot stand. A home that is divided, cannot stand. Two brothers, two sisters that are divided, nothing good comes from that. God gave us love. He gave us forgiveness. Praise God for His grace, what we receive that we do not deserve. Praise God for His mercy. He lets those sins go as far away from each other as the east is from the west. I stand before you Clean, not because I'm a good person, but because a great king has set me free. Now, if you're having troubles between one person and another, whose lies are you hearing? I don't care what happens. We are to be there to encourage and to celebrate Christ in them, the hope of glory. If there's division, we cannot stand. Church, how many times have y'all heard me say these words? One heart, one soul. Christ's heart, that's what we want. Christ's soul, that's what we're going to follow. Christ and Christ alone. That's what makes us family, folks. That's what makes us one. We're not one in my thoughts. We're not one in your thoughts. We're one in Christ. Do you think... Satan will do anything that he can to divide. That's who he is. And that's what he does. So he says in verse 27, I love this. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. I like that word binds. And then he will plunder his house. If you're going to go into somebody's, look, if, if I'm going to Johnny's house, he's bigger than I am. So I'm going to probably get me a stun gun. Bam! And then when I got him stunned, I'll wrap him up. He probably burst out of him like the Hulk, you know. But, but I'm going to do everything that I can to bind him so that I can go through his house and steal what I want. Right? How does Satan bind temptations and lies? But what does Christ do? He came to the man who was demon-possessed and blind and mute, 
and he cast out the demon, and then he freed up all of life to come in behind him. There are so many people that are bound by the ugliness and the, and the works of Satan in this world, and they think it's making themselves happy, and they get into addictions, and they get into all these things because they're looking for the, the sin that thrills for a moment. But what they need is Christ so they can be set free and be free indeed and have joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's the greatest. It's the best. It's wonderful. I wouldn't give anything up to have what this world has. But I give everything up to get what Christ can give. He said, look, you got to come in and bind him. Can Satan bind the Almighty God? No. And who is the power of the Almighty God? The Holy Spirit. From Genesis, creation, God said it. And the Spirit took those words and made it alive. And it was exactly the way God said it would be, and it was good. Amen? One day, Jesus is coming back. He'll come back to gather his own, but you know what else he's going to do? He's going to stomp on Satan's head. He's going to stomp on his head. You know, it goes on to say, verse 28, Surely I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. You can blaspheme God. I went to a, a QT this week. I, I already had gas, but I wanted a cup of coffee. So I was got my cup of coffee, and I came back out in the parking lot, and there's, I thought it was going to be a wreck. This truck came up, and Right. And what it was was this other guy that was a friend of theirs, and they were just trying to scare him. And that guy got up and just was cussing left and cussing right, and he said, GD this and GD that. And I thought, why are you damning my God? And my spirit grieved. I grieved in my spirit. But God still looked at him and said, I love you. How many people curse the name of Jesus in this world today. I mean, you can just say the name, you can speak the name of Jesus and there's power in it, but also in this world, you can speak the name of Jesus and people will get madder than mad. This religion, you can say whatever you want to about, I mean, it, you can't say anything about that religion, you can't say anything about that religion, but you say something about Christianity and it's, it's free reign, you can say whatever you want. Jesus let them spit in his face, curse him, beat him, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them. But the Holy Spirit, please listen, and I'm going to close. No one can get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them and brings them to God. But if you refuse to listen, he refuses to save. He's not going to save you over your own wishes and desires. He'll present. He'll love. He has the power to save. But church, you have to accept. Salvation is by grace through faith. Grace is what we don't deserve, but he's going to give us salvation anyway. Through faith. Faith is believing and acting on it. Acting on it. Being a follower of Christ is giving your life to Him as the Lord and Savior of your life. So as the Holy Spirit woos you, the Holy Spirit is the acting power of God, and, and He is there for you. But if you blaspheme, the word blaspheme means to speak reproach, reproachfully, evil, evil spoken against, reviled, railed at. I think blaspheme just kind of says it all in one. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, what other hope of salvation do you have? You can't get to Jesus unless through the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is the unpardonable sin. You have no hope. There is only one way. 
There's only one truth. And there's only one life. And there's only one way to get to Jesus. Who can save you, no matter what? Who will forgive you of all? I don't care if Satan tells you, no, he won't forgive you of all. If you get saved, you're already forgiven of all. But if you don't come, if you refuse, you're on your own. Is it the first time? Maybe, maybe not. Is it the hundredth time? Maybe, maybe not. But there's one time that you're going to step over the grace of God 